Rabbi Ben Amit. Today is the Sunday before the Feast of the Elevation of the Divine, Precious and Life-Giving Cross of the Lord. The Feast that we celebrate on September 14th in the Church. We will be celebrating that on the eve of the Feast at this parish on Tuesday evening. I hope and I pray that I'll see many of you here because it's a glorious feast. And as part of our celebration, we will be walking in procession with the Holy Cross around the church, inside the church. And when we come to the front of the church, the cross will be elevated for all to see and to venerate. In doing so, we will be commemorating two historical events and we will read about these events on Tuesday. Today, I'd like us to reflect on the cross. In fact, today's sermon is part one of two sermons that, uh, that are reflecting on the meaning of the Holy Cross. Today, we will unpack the meaning of the cross and next Sunday, we will meditate on our response to the cross. You know, the cross is at the center of the Holy Gospel. And the cross, the, the place that we have for the cross in the church, tells us something about the place that the cross should have in our spiritual life. It is hard to enter an Orthodox Church and not notice many, many crosses. Almost, we can't look anywhere and not see the Holy Cross. I know there's a game that Kurigi plays with the kids and the, she tells them to spot all the different crosses everywhere. But more importantly, the cross is placed at the very front of the church, right in front of the holy altar, so that the priest is always looking at it, and so that we're all looking at it, so that our eyes are always looking toward the one who was lifted up on the cross. We fixate our eyes on the cross, and on this particular feast, we elevate the cross for all to see, because the power of God, His wisdom, and His love are on display on the cross. I'm going to go through several readings that we go through between today and Tuesday, and, or Wednesday really, and, and next Sunday, to try to unpack these things about how the cross displays the power, wisdom, and love of God. Of course, the Lord's crucifixion was painful and was marked by unimaginable suffering, the unjust suffering of the one who is without sin. Yet without denying these realities, the Orthodox Church is unique among Christian confessions in that we do not fixate on painful images of suffering, of blood, and of disfigurement. Not that these things did not occur, we just do not make it the center of our view of the cross. Our tradition focuses on the crucifixion as the most complete expression of the power of God. The evangelists themselves, the holy apostles and the holy fathers after them, saw the cross first and foremost as a sign of victory. It is no longer a symbol of torture and shame, but a sign, the sign of the victory of Christ over sin, over death, and over the devil. Death 
the result of sin and corruption, the final enemy that instilled fear and paralyzed human existence, that death is destroyed by the power of the cross. Completely destroyed, not partially, completely. The cross is where death goes to die. Death has no more reign over humanity because the cross has destroyed the devil and has undone his works. And we can now be liberated from the fear of dying. Of course, the cross itself is but a piece of wood. And by itself, it has no power. The power of the cross is the power of the one who ascended it by his own will. The cross destroys death and the devil because the one who is crucified on it is not a mere man, but the God-man, Jesus Christ. And so because he is God, St. Basil says, it was not possible that the author of life should be held of corruption or death. So the Lord destroys death when he ascends on the cross. And because he is man, he dismantles the hold of death over us. That's the invincible power of the precious cross. And that's why we say that the cross is first and foremost a sign of victory. The cross shows not only the power of God, but also the wisdom of God. On the day of the feast, we will read from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will thwart. St. Paul continues, For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign, and Greeks seek wisdom. Here he's talking about the Greeks before Christianity, the Gentiles. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, a folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, St. Paul was both a Jew and a Gentile. For he had a Gentile background. And he had a deep knowledge of the wisdom tradition of both Greeks and Jews. Not only did he understand those traditions, he in his own words advanced so much in the Jewish tradition that he persecuted those who followed Christ. We know his story and his own experience revealed to him that neither of these traditions could save the human race nor even bring one to knowledge of God. And by the way, don't think that today's wisdom has evolved much further than the philosophies that were familiar to St. Paul. All that circulates as wisdom today is nothing but a repackaging of Greek and Gnostic philosophies. St. Paul understood that there is no wisdom capable of saving us outside of the cross. So he goes on to tell the Corinthians, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So what we've said so far about the power of God and the wisdom of God already point to that which is even greater than power and wisdom. They point to the love of God 
And in today's Gospel reading, the Lord says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. And then He goes on to say, For God so loved the world, so that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. That verse from John 3.16 is perhaps the most quoted verse from the New Testament that we've become a little numb to it. The words God so loved the word describe not only how much God loved the world, but in what way He loved the world. It is clear that the Lord is speaking about His love in connection with His crucifixion. And the Lord connects His crucifixion with what happened to the people of God, to the people of Israel as they journeyed in the wilderness. You know, with Christ, who through Moses had led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. There was no shortage of divine signs throughout the Exodus, and God never abandoned His people. But the people became discouraged nonetheless. And they blasphemed against God and His servant Moses. So God allowed that they be bitten by fiery snakes, and many who were bitten died. When they repented, God instructed Moses to set a snake on a pole, and whoever had been bitten by a snake would be healed simply by looking at the bronze snake that Moses had lifted up on the pole. This image of the crucifixion that the Lord gives shows us what kind of love is on display on the cross. Because the condition of humanity, our condition today, is very much the same as for the people of Israel. Humanity is suffering from the venom of sin, and that sin is our own doing, whether personally or collectively. Haven't we rebelled against God? despite the many signs He has given us. Don't we often lose our trust in Him, despite His promise that He will be with us always? And don't we always lose our way, despite the many signposts He has provided to guide us? Yet this is the love of God. This love is not a feeling, but in action, it's actually a rescue mission. He did not demand of us to have everything sorted out, or that we be, become perfect so that He would come and rescue us. St. Paul writes that God shows His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In that sense, God's love this rescue mission to free us from sin is a divine gamble on the part of Christ. Because Christ did this while completely respecting our freedom. That's because this is how love works. Love desires the freedom of our beloved. We can't love someone and shackle them and deprive them of their freedom. Love requires that we desire freedom, including the freedom to reject Him, the freedom to insult Him, to betray Him, and indeed to crucify Him. This is how the love of God is displayed upon the cross. This is how His love was poured out for the salvation of the world. Not only does He not wait for us to be sinless, 
in order to rescue us. But the scripture says that Christ took on our sins when he ascended the cross. So now all of us who are infected by the, by the venom of sin may receive life by keeping our eyes on the one who was crucified on the tree. This is why St. Paul says, I decided to know nothing among you except Christ, except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This is what we will commemorate when we celebrate the elevation of the cross this week. We lift up the cross to keep our gaze upon the one who willingly ascended on it so that we may receive life. Brothers and sisters of faith, without the cross will not lead us to God. Only the cross can restore us to communion with God. The cross of the Lord is something that we are invited to enter into, not to avoid. In today's epistle, St. Paul says that the problem with the Judaizers who are troubling the Galatians is precisely that they refused to share in the cross. He says they want to glory in your flesh. But then he goes on, But far be it for me to glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. This is St. Paul's response to God's love displayed in the cross. But this is of little importance, because the more important question 